I'm delighted uh, to welcome um, an old friend, a friend of the FTs, um, someone who'll be familiar to probably most of you in this room, Lord Mark Mullock Brown, um, former UK minister, I can't really remember of what, so I'm not going to go there, <laughs> a development specialist, and of course, Deputy Secretary General of the UN under Kofi Annan, and a man with a genuinely deep knowledge um, um, of Africa and a grasp of Africa. Um, who now works with the international, or as it's been rebranded, the crisis group. Um, uh, and we're going we're, we're to sit down and have a, a, a conversation for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we will let you back to your burnt steak. <laughs> Thank you so much for, uh, for, for joining us. So today has been a conversation where, in a sense, deliberately, um, but I think we have not forced the conversation. We have looked on the bright side to, to a certain extent. We've looked at innovation, we've looked at solutions, and I think a surprising amount that, that is often covered up um, um, has, has, has come out of this. So I sort of want to ask you, um, before I go into the kind of the crisis element, I mean, it is true, isn't it, that things are a lot better generally than people think, than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. You know, I mean, there's this view of Steven Pinker, of Hans Rosling, that the world is not really, you know, it's not, we don't really cope very well with gradualism. We're very good at understanding a crisis, but we're not very good at spotting that things are slowly getting better. Uh, so, you know, somewhat from the crisis group, and of course we will talk about this. I mean, do you acknowledge that, that, that not everything we've talked about today is just hot air, that actually things are, are changing? No, I absolutely do. And, um, you know, I was Comfort Hero, our Africa director, who spoke in an earlier panel, and I were, you know, comparing notes. And, you know, really, from the time that I was Kofi Annan's deputy and would get woken up every night by some incident, in you know, report of some incident in one of our peacekeeping operations somewhere around Africa. This has now dwindled down to really two core conflict areas, Somalia and the Horn, and the sort of Mali-West Africa cluster of, of conflict. And those, neither of those are going particularly well. They're sort of creeping into neighbors. Burkina Faso is getting drawn into the Mali conflict. And you know there continue to be problems in, in, in northern Kenya and, and even in parts of Ethiopia around the Somalia conflict. But compared to these massive peacekeeping deployments of 20 years ago, this is a much more stable continent. And so in that sense, I think it's less about today's crises and more about tomorrow's challenges, which were so well spoken to today, the demography, the climate change, the impact of AI, uh, the gap between rather sort of analog government and a digital youth in the continent. All of those are challenging issues for the future. But old-style conflict is, at least for now, an eclipse in the continent. Right. Well, I mean, we'll talk about old-style conflict in a, in, a, in a moment. But what, you know, that you've heard today and that you know from, your, you know, as I say, your, your deep knowledge of the continent, what, you know, what is, what is happening that you think is, is good? What is positive? Well, first, that we can assemble in carriages under yours and Bernie <laughs> and... and, uh, and, and uh, and Lionel's and Yvonne's uh, hospitality and um, not think it mad. Uh, we, we, we actually don't have to be in the Stanley and Nairobi anymore to talk about Africa. And, you know, that's a strange thing because 10 years ago, if you talked in Claridge's about Africa, it was colonialist, it was paternalistic, it was whatever. Today, London is a services hub an investment hub for Africa. It's Africa's extra capital. Um, and so, you know, for all of those who are sort of worried about, you know, whether is, there is still a touch of history and paternalism, the fact we can do this in London and not feel embarrassed about it shows how rapidly the economic relations between the countries of Africa and, and the UK are equalizing. And I like to attribute that all to the rise of 
those African countries, but I'm afraid I have to put a bit of it down to the rapid decline of Britain. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about a couple of the, um, the, the you know, the hotspots um, uh, in Africa. But let's start with um, well, let's start with Sudan, yeah. which is not which is not a bad story necessarily at all. Um, you know, we've had the, the fall of Bashir. I mean, I was fortunate enough to go earlier this year. Um, we had a rise of um, you know a youthful population that was on the streets that was uh, demonstrating very peacefully, um, and that forced a certain change, a very fragile change. I mean, I'm yeah. not you know, huge, wholly optimistic about what will happen next. What's your assessment of what's happened in Sudan, what the challenges are and what's likely to happen uh, as we go forward? Well, I think with both Sudan and, for that matter, the DRC, you know, you, you have to watch carefully. It's too soon to kind of declare permanent victory. Uh, we've seen too many of these transitions in the past come off the rails. But I think Hamdu, the new sort of leader in Sudan for all practical purposes of, 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 of the, the civilian government, you know, an old colleague of Mo Ibrahim's, uh, you know, a real fine technocrat. Um, it, it's a promising start, but you know, this is the sort of reverse of the UK and, and an improbable one. In Sudan, young intellectuals and indeed their professor parents have prevailed over older groups. In the UK, it's completely the other way around. <laughs> but anyway, um, but, but you know, I, I think that Sudan, this was long overdue. I mean, you know, I used to meet with Bashir regularly as first head of UNDP, then a deputy secretary general, and finally as UK minister. And, you know, talk about an analog guy as the world was changing around him. Um, you know, this, this had to happen. Um, and, you know, I think the challenge is keeping it on track, as it is with the DRC. But when you take Sudan and DRC out of the conflict and failed state column and put them into the opportunity column, this is a major sort of rebalancing of the whole Africa set. I wasn't going to bring up DRC, um, but, as, uh, but as you've mentioned it a few times, I mean, you know, the FT ran a story earlier this year about the election result where we were pretty convinced and I think had fairly strong evidence that, um, that the winner, supposed winner of the election wasn't really the winner of the election. And we thought we had proof of that. And yet Africa rallied around eventually, and the world, in fact, it, it rallied around, you know, Mr. Chisakedi, um, who was supposedly... Um, yeah. the winner of that election. Where, where does this leave um, DRC? And of course, DRC is plugged into the world because it has cobalt, it has many other things, but it, it's sort of at the heart of the green revolution and batteries and electric cars and all of that. And where does, that, where does this leave DRC? Well, I, look, I, I, I completely believe in the FT story. I think it was 101% right, Mr. Editor. Um, and... Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, you know, was as troubled by the outcome and saw it as, you know, both a collapse of the kind of African leadership we'd been used to from major powers promoting a democracy agenda in Africa, notably Cyril Ramaphosa's South Africa, but less, more predictably, you know, the Nigerians were asleep at the wheel. Um, and, and so I found that very disappointing, and I equally found it highly disappointing that a U.S. administration and its European counterparts, including the U.K., didn't stand up on this one. So, you know, FT, completely right. Um, but, you know, there is a nature about regime changes where Shikade's power base is the capital city, Kinshasa. And... You know, the story of revolutions is control the capital. And particularly in a country as large and population dispersed as the DRC. So I think it was absolutely less an optimal outcome. Uh, but I think it has set the DRC on a path of sort of tentative reform. But even more than the Sudan one, we've all got to sort of stay in there behind and keep pushing from our different perspectives on right. that. 
I'd like to, to turn, before we turn to the big future issues that you've mentioned, demography, climate change, migration, um, just to Ethiopia. Yeah. Um, I mean, Ethiopia strikes me as the most hopeful story in Africa in some ways, this big economy that's been growing, you know, very fast for a long time. It ran up, up against the kind of political, you know, limits of what it could do. And then, hey, presto, it has, you know, a new prime minister who for all, you know, the challenges and, you know, personal and political um, uh, he faces, you know, I think was a worthy winner of the, of the Nobel Prize. And yet this country also faces enormous challenges, um, you know, almost existential challenges. How do you see Ethiopia? Well, look, I, I think like everybody in this room, I'm completely thrilled he got the Nobel Prize. And I think the bravery in reaching out to Eritrea, but the bravery across the domestic reform agenda that he's introduced and everything else merits that prize. But, you know, it's more in the Obama category than some of the other prizes. It's not a prize for work complete, it's a prize for work begun. And I do think we need to keep that in mind because, you know, I, I think that on the one hand, he is building on the legacy of two remarkable predecessors. And I know that not everybody in this room will agree with that, but I think uh, that both Prime Minister Meles and then Haile Mariam, you know, were necessary predecessors. They sort of set this up for Abiy. And I think, you know, we should acknowledge their role too. And, you know, as someone who's been in development most, well, all of my professional life, you know, I, I, I always think it needs some people to lay the seeds before you get to the people who harvest them. And, you know, while those Ethiopian leaders had not allowed the political space that Abiy is now allowed, they had la they'd laid the economic development fundamentals in an extraordinary way. Um, but you then get to Abiy and, you know, it's challenging because, you know, he is shaking up the sort of still ethnic-based politics of his country. You know, there are people in Ethiopia, and I've talked to some Ethiopians in the room tonight who don't completely agree with me on this, so I'm <laughs> going to stumble through it as best I can in the hope that Sega and others don't challenge me. But, um, but you know, in truth, there are those who view his outreach to Eritrea as more of a move against the previous Tigrayan controlled regime than they do a real effort to build peace with Eritrea. And in that sense, it's so far been a relatively cold peace. You've not seen the follow-up sort of cultural open border, let alone business exchanges that you would want to see. But again, that makes the Nobel even more important because this gives this guy who's already been the victim of a near coup, who's lost a couple of his senior leaders in assassinations, it gives him the moral authority that the world's on his side. So, you know, this really important country that's come so far over the last 20, 30 years, I think we all just hope that this Nobel can help cement that and push the momentum forward. Let's move on to, um, uh, to some of the sort of, let's, let's call them future challenges. So first of all, d um, demography. You know, demography could be Africa's great advantage, youthful population, median age in Africa is 19. That necessarily means that the population is, is still growing extraordinarily fast. It will double in the next 20 or 30 years. It may double again in the 50 years after that. You know, projections show that by the end of the century, I know it's a long time away, but four in 11 people on earth will be African. Um, you know, this is the kind of, the, you know, this is where the action is happening dem demographically in the world. What do you make of that? Well, I think, you know, both Africa and the neighborhood, by which I mean Europe, you know, are completely failed to take this on board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that Europe is still, you know, turning migrants away in the Mediterranean rather than understanding that if you look at the future of European labor supply, we need a serious migration relationship with Africa. As we age and that youth bulge happens, you know, we should be investing in Africa's education. You know, all sorts of things we should be doing to understand our interlinked economic and, and, and social destiny going forward. 
Um, but I think for, for, for Africa itself, you know, the, the changes, vis I mean, the, the, the future tension around this is visible at a number of levels. First, as the Mo Ibrahim Index, you know, annually reports, you know, African growth is not creating anything like the number of jobs that are needed. And a lot of people have commented on this. I heard the figure today of a 300 million job deficit because the economic growth is job light. And so, you know, we've got to address that. And, you know, it, it's fine to say that uh, the African fourth industrial revolution model is a smokestack free model. But we have to work out where within the services sectors, where within the light industry sectors, where within this new AI automated world, those jobs for this continent are going to come from. So I think there's a massive imagination and public policy challenge that has not been met. But at the same time, David, as your question implies, you know, a young Africa in an old world is a huge opportunity, if you can flip it to that. Um, and you were Asia editor before you were Africa editor, and we were old friends then, and you came to see me as you took over Africa. And I remember saying to you, watch the demography, because you know, Asia's competitive advantage over the world was a young population willing to work very hard. And you know, if a generation of African leaders can show the same kind of determined, multi-year, solid leadership sticking to their goals, there's no reason why the continent shouldn't enjoy some of that success that you chronicled so, so well in Asia. Um, climate change, let's end on climate change. Um, you know, I mean, this, this has come up, up the agenda uh, uh, recently. Um, with Greta and all of that. Um, I still think that the world hasn't kind of grappled, and I'm actually about to write, I think, a big piece on this, but the world hasn't quite grappled as to what this means in Africa for Africa. Um, you know, th this is where kind of crisis groups, research really comes into its own. What, 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 what should we be looking out for? Well, you know, you, you see, for example, in Nigeria today, you know, not uniquely, but a conflict between herders and farmers in the middle belt of Nigeria, which is very clearly, you know, climate driven as the amount of arable land decreases and herders and farmers are, you know, fighting for control of it. And that is replicated across much of a continent where still too much farming is rain fed and undercapitalized and where the Sahel belt relentlessly grows every year. And so, you know, the, the issues of applying technology of which we've heard so much today to kind of protect and mitigate the effects of climate change and ensure a viable African agricultural sector for the future are very real. I mean, I always prefer as someone who, you know, worked, ran UNDP, the UN Development Program for a long time, I always prefer to talk about this in terms of development and livelihoods than climate change, because I always think climate change summons up the idea of Westerners and their livelihoods under threat from global climate change, whereas I think what we have to bring home is that it is farmers, urban and rural populations in Africa, but for that matter, Latin America and South Asia as well, who through no fault of their own, are on the first la front line of all of this. And, you know, strategies which allow them to preserve their livelihoods and use smart technology and new crop seeds to, to allow them to do that is, is absolutely critical. And, you know, at the moment it feeds into what, you know, a number of speakers talked about today of almost a sort of blame game about you know, where these ills have come from, when it's what it needs to turn into is a joint effort to make sure that African agriculture not only remains viable, but comes more productive to feed a larger population. And there simply at the moment isn't the sort of strategic planning or the grip for that. The leader who did most on it was to go back to what we're saying about Ethiopia, Prime Minister Meles, who, who, who really 
thought about this in a profound way, but sadly many others are not. And does the West need to pay for this? I mean, does, is, does this mean money that... Well, what I said about the interrelated fortunes of Europe and, and, and Africa in terms of demography, shared markets, shared neighbourhoods, means that I think Europe should be a major, not donor, but investor in solutions to this. And you know, increasing these solutions are going to be private sector, because I think the other point I'd make just listening to today's conversation is, you know, the private sector in Africa is going to look completely different to the bottom line private sector of, of, of Europe. Um, you know, Lionel's articles in the FT about the modern corporation. You know, if you look at it from the African perspective, a successful corporation, you know, the, the good or the CEO of a successful corporation will be a social worker as well as a CFO. You know, he or she will be all about, you know, the impact on their communities, the quality and support to their workforces. You know, it's going to be a role in which the private sector plays a much more enhanced or covers a much more enhanced space than we've been traditionally used to uh, here in Europe. They're going to be real actors in the continent's future. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave it there, partly in the interest of our stake. Yes. But what a now fascinating well conversation, I think. <laughs>